We're going to talk about three basic things tonight. Aaron Moore talked about breaking the yoke of bondage, breaking the yoke of the oppressor, Isaiah 9.4. We're going to touch on that, starting by talking about peanuts, and we're going to go talk about Gideon in that. So that's the first part. The second thing, uh, Stuart Hanna was here last week and talking about the axe head, and so we're going to talk about the axe head and what was Kurt's interpretation of the real issue with the axe head and how that relates to Jesus turning water into wine. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is the last chapter of John, and that's having breakfast with Jesus. So all of that needs a title. So this title is going to make a lot of sense. It's going to combine right in there. So the title of this message is, We Bought a Zoo. Anybody seen that movie? It's probably five years old now. It's Matt Damon and Scarlett Johansson and whatever, and I almost forget the way the storyline goes, but... He was married, I think his wife dies, he's got some kids, he wants to be a cool dad, he's having trouble relating to the kids, and somewhere in the middle of it, all of a sudden, he buys a zoo. And I think in the middle of the story somewhere, Scarlett Johansson's one of the zookeepers, and you know, she's a scientist kind of person, and she looks at him and she goes like, you have absolutely no idea what to do with these animals, like why did you buy this zoo? And here was his response. Sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage just literally 20 seconds of just embarrassing bravery, and I promise you something great will come of it. So can we talk about that tonight? Can you say insane courage? I, I hate when people speak and they make you say things. Literally, I do, and tonight I'm probably going to make you do that all night long. One more time. Insane courage. Insane courage. Embarrassing, bravery. embarrassing bravery. Something great comes of it. 20 seconds. Okay. All right. So let's get into this. So Aaron Moore is speaking, and he's talking about the, the breaking the yoke of bondage, the rod of the oppressor. The simple terms what that is, they put a, a big, heavy wood yoke over the oxen to keep them together, and they pulled a plow or, or they walked a mill wheel around or whatever, but they need to stop and eat every once in a while. They also need to stop and, you know, at the other end and they lose their way, and so the person watching them has a rod, so they're constantly tapping them on the rear, saying, Kurt, make the bed, and Kurt, wash the dishes, and no, um, to, to keep the oxen going, okay? But that's what happened to Israel, but it was a bondage, it was horrible. They, it was like when they were in Egypt, and they had to make their own bricks and find their own straw, and so all of the nations that were the ites, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the Amorites and the Stalactites and all the ites, they were such an oppression and just beating them all the time. And Isaiah 9, 4, Aaron told us, God said, I broke all that just like it was in Midian. And at the end of that message, I don't know why, but sometimes I see pictures of things and I got a picture of a bag of peanuts in my head. So it's like, okay, what's a bag of peanuts about? And I happen to think I have this thing called American Patriot Bible. Everybody kids me that's the Donald Trump Bible. But it's got these little blurbs in it about people in American history who trusted God. And there was a guy named George Washington Carver. He um, gets born right after the Civil War. The Civil War was a big fight over slavery. Uh, Great Britain was smart 30 years earlier, and they just voted and said, who wants to end slavery? And everybody said, I do. And slavery was over. It's 30 years later in the U.S., and what did we do? We killed 600,000 of each of us in order to abolish slavery. I don't bring that up very often. But... but um, George Washington Carver was born right after the Civil War, so he grows up in a period of the black man still, even though slavery is abolished, nobody has any respect for the black man. And it's still in the South, and they're still using cotton all the time. Well, cotton is a huge depleting crop of the soil, and so it was very hard for people to get started unless you were already on one of these huge plantations. So he was looking for alternatives, and he's messing around with the soybean, he's messing around with sweet potatoes or kumara over here, but he starts messing around with the peanut. And he finds 300 uses for the peanut, which I thought, well, that's curious, God, which I was reading my little blurb here, because Gideon fought with how many men? 300 men who were absolutely nuts. And one day, because he was so successful with inventions of things that peanuts and peanut oil could do, that he went to Congress to talk about tariffs on peanuts and what he was learning. And one of the senators said, uh, Mr. Carver, like, how did you learn about peanuts? And he said, well, I read it in the Bible. And the guy goes, wait a minute, I have never read about peanuts in the Bible. And what George Washington Carver said, actually, it's not about the peanut, it's about the creator of the peanut. 
I knew God created the peanut, and I knew if I just asked him, tell me what you would do, God, with the peanut that you created, he'll tell me. And that's exactly what he did, and he found over 300 uses how to use the peanut. So part of what I want to say to you today is you're all nuts. But as the nut, realize God created you with multiple purposes, and he knows exactly what he wants you to do if you just simply say to him, Lord, how did you make me, and why did you make me just like George Washington Carver? Now, the one issue is, because I want to get back to the oppression and the yoke, is the peanut had to be out of the shell. So we all have this outer shell. We all have this thing that we think is protecting us, but it's actually keeping us from the 300 uses that God the scientist would love to get in the laboratory with and show you how he wants to use you. And that oppression, that uh, yoke of bondage, that peanut shell has been broken once and forever on the cross. Amen. George Washington Carver said this, I got some of these I got to read. He said, do not be surprised what God can do with a willing man in a laboratory. God uses life like a laboratory. He will work with me to make me into his purpose and into his calling. So out of the yoke of oppression in Isaiah 9, we came up with nuts. Okay, so here we go. So the other part of that scripture then was in the time of Midian. So in the time of Midian says we got to learn about Gideon which that rhymed if you didn't pick that up. So let's go to Judges 6. We're going to wander through the scripture for a bit. If you don't have your Bibles, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Okay, we're going to speed read, all right? That's Judges 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges. There we go. So in in, uh, verse 1, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. God's in the numbers. Seven is a completion. Three is a completion. We won't go into all that, but we're going to actually talk about three several times. I thought it was interesting tonight. So the the children of Israel, because they did evil and they're delivered into the hands of Midian, if you keep reading there, verse 2, they're in dens and caves and strongholds. They're hiding. And whatever they sow... The uh, Midianites and the Amalekites come and they destroy the produce of the earth, verse 4, and they leave no sustenance for Israel. Verse 5, they're as numerous as locusts, without number. They enter the land to destroy it, and they greatly impoverished Israel. So say that with me. My enemies are numerous as locusts, without number. They come into my land. They destroy me. I am greatly impoverished. And God's not worried about that at all. I stuck that part in there in case you didn't catch that. Israel cries out to the Lord. What does God do? Verse 8, he sends a prophet. Sometimes prophets come with a general, logical understanding of things. Here's how God generally works in this situation, and that he wants to tell you specifically what's going to happen. We talk about that with two words with God's word, logos and rhema. There are times when there is a logical understanding of things like the call log on your phone. You know, all the people that are logged that call for the day, this is how God does things. But sometimes it's a rhema word and that's different. Instead of this logical intellectual plodding along, the word rhema says the way God speaks to break the silence. So from time to time he says, now, boom. That's different than the logical understanding. In this case, I think this prophetic person is logical and he says, do you remember how God took the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he delivered them from bondage. He can do it again. That's the starting point. That's the frame around the picture. Now I want you to go paint the picture. So Gideon, verse 11, 12 there, Gideon is threshing wheat in the wine press. Now what's wrong with that? Wine press is for wine. Wheat is a common, ordinary thing. It's like a bread we would say wine is a spiritual thing. So we might say Gideon is trying natural circumstances, trying to find a spiritual outcome. And he's hiding. He's threshing wheat, which just means he's hoping the wine press is tall enough because he's trying to separate the wheat from the chaff, the kernels of wheat. So they've got a fork, the wheat's on the ground, and they're throwing it up 
and hoping that that breaks the kernels off and they fall back down and hit the ground and somewhere you can sweep the kernels up and pull the chaff out of the way. So it's up and down and up and down. And Gideon's probably really busy doing that. He's hiding. And what does God do? God says to him, excuse, yeah, he says to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon, you are a mighty warrior. The first question is, is Gideon too busy to even pay attention? Thanks for that, Lord, but I'm busy threshing wheat right now, and I've got a lot to do here, and the Midianites are going to find me if I don't get done, and we're doing okay here. We still have food to eat. Yes, we're under huge bondage, and that's a really nice promise, God, but I've got to go back to threshing wheat. And he turns around and he says, why has all this happened to us? Today we want to go, duh, the very first verse says, you did evil in the sight of the Lord. The prophet said, I left this out at the bottom of verse 10, he said, you did not obey my voice. The next thing he says is, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracles? The Lord has forsaken us. And I want to say, didn't you listen to what the prophet just said? All those miracles I did back in Egypt in the Red Sea, like, I'll do that again. And he totally misses that. So God's willing to work with him a second time, and he says, Gideon, verse 14, second time, go. Put some action to this in the might of yours that you have, and you're going to save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Did I not just tell you, you are a mighty man of valor? So a second time, he comes and encourages Gideon that he's with him. He's not just saying you're a mighty man of valor. He's saying, I sent you, and I'm going to go with you. He says, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest. I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord basically says, I'm... I'm you're a slow learner here, but I don't care about that. I, I'm going with you. I will be with you. So he says, show me a sign. Now, the thing about the sign um, is he does two things. Um, he says uh, he builds an altar, and he tears down his father's Asherah pole or the idol. So there's two issues. They have no actual relationship with their God. They're hiding and they keep running back to the idols. So to a certain extent, Gideon might have said, what are the things that keep me separated from God? What are the things that keep me from relating to God? And that would take us a long way today. So he tears down his father's Asherah pole. He takes away the things that's separating him from God. And he also says, let's eat a meal together. Let's create an altar. I want to create a sacrifice. I want my relationship. I want my heart back with you again. He's starting to get the fact that he is a mighty warrior. He does be a little bit scared. If you go down to verse 27 and through there, he does tear the Asherah pole down, but he does it at night so people won't um, find what he did. Now, I don't want to miss here just for a second. First Samuel 9 is an instant replay of this story. This is Saul getting ready to be made king, and we won't go there. But Saul's a tall, dark, and handsome guy. <laughs> Why was that funny? Over there. Oh my God. And he's Israel's choice of king. He's not really God's choice of king. But God didn't say, Saul, this isn't going to work out for you. God basically said, I still love my people. And even though the prophet Samuel said, Saul's going to take, 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 take like seven times, he says, He will take, he will take your, your sons and your daughters and your donkeys and sheep and your crops and all that stuff. And God knows it's not going to work out. He looks at Saul and he says, Samuel's got. A meal for you and he's actually got the meat set apart for you so have this meal with him and take his direction and then on the way home you're gonna pass into a group of prophets and when you meet with them the spirit of those prophets will fall on you and you will be turned into another man it was God's intent that Saul could still be successful except Saul couldn't do what the prophet asked him to do and it all unraveled but the point is this, God will turn you into another man. Gideon is not that man yet, but God already sees him as that man, and he's going to take him through some steps to turn him into that man. With just 20 seconds of embarrassing bravery, Gideon can make a choice and go, I'm getting rid of the idols. I'm going to create an altar here, God, and I'm going to change this thing around. I'm going to become the promise that you asked me to become. So God comes and consumes the fire, consumes the meat, consumes the altar, um, and we're off and running. Now, when he takes the Asherah pole down in the morning, they wake up because they like their idols, and they go, who did this? 
And part of what I would say to you is, as you begin to walk out God's promise, you need to get comfortable with the assault that's going to happen with that. People are going to come against you, and they're not going to like your success, and they're not going to believe your story. And you have to get comfortable with that and go back to God's promise and do what the promise says. Verse 34, the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew the trumpet. So Gideon has got to call the people to order and start letting them know what's going on. So Gideon blows the trumpet. <laughs> Isn't that how a shofar goes? Shofar so good? <laughs> and everybody comes running up. Whoa, sorry. And the question is, Gideon, do you have anything to say? So... God is interested in giving you a trumpet that matches your promise. He's not going to ask you to do something and portray something that doesn't become part of you. So Gideon gets them together, and as you look at the story, it's not 30,000 men and it's not uh, 8,000 men. It's 300 nuts learning from one nut who takes a promise because God takes one man or one woman and gives them a promise. And as they work it out and as they serve others, that thing gets into everybody else, and it works. What do I want to finish with? Like three times now, he's come to Gideon and said, you're a mighty warrior, I'm going to be with there. we'll do it again. All this kind of stuff. He comes even a fourth time and says, Gideon, I'll give you a dream. So this guy has a dream, and it's a barley loaf of barley bread that rolls into the camp and smashes the tent. Now, why is that significant? Well, I'm not sure, but I have read that back then, a, a loaf of barley bread was like cheap bread. Today, like cheap white bread, you know, it doesn't take much to get a loaf of cheap white bread in the store. And that was like a loaf of cheap white bread. But the guy interprets the dream and says, oh my God, the barley bread that smashes the tent that wins the day, that's none other than the sword of Gideon and the Lord, his destroying God. And to a certain extent, he might have said, Gideon, you're like a loaf of cheap white bread. You actually have no business trying to do what you're trying to do. But God is with you. And he's the one that will win the day. And so that creates strength in Gideon, and it creates courage in him. And so he goes and he wins the day. So they fight, and I'm not going to go into all that where they put their swords, hide your light under a bushel and all that kind of stuff, but they win the day. And when it's all said and done, chapter 8, verse 28, Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so they lifted their heads no more. The country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. So one man with one promise getting an, an alignment with his God, changing where he is, getting out of the wine press, finding a wine skin that fits him, enrolling others, being the nut that God asked him to be creates peace for 40 years. Here's the scary part. Verse 33, so it was as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal beareth their God. That's really scary, and I don't have a whole lot to say about that, but it's really a shame when we do great things for God. It needs to be from generation to generation. Okay, let me see if I left something out here. That's the first part. I'm encouraging you to receive God's promise and to act on it. I left out about getting out of your comfort zone. You must obey. Turning the wheat into wine or being in the wine press, because we're going to talk about water into wine here in a second is like turning the common or natural things into God's purposes. That natural effort alone never becomes God's purposes and miracles. And we're not allowed to hide. Sorry. Allow God the time to give you a promise. How busy are you and are you so busy that he can't speak to you? Your circumstance, your ability does not qualify you. Your circumstance, your ability does not unqualify you. What qualifies you is your steps of faith acting on God's promise. You act out who God says you are and you speak who God says you are. You quit looking inward for the ability. The ability is in your faith steps towards your promise. Part of the crossing from wheat to wine or from water into wine or just from common to spiritual might have been in the trumpet. That might have been so foreign to Gideon to blow the trumpet and in one 22nd place of courage and bravery, 
he blows a trumpet and that might have changed everything. Don't be surprised if God puts you someday in a place where this is the moment and it changes everything. And the question is, how will you act? Do something you wouldn't normally do to receive something you wouldn't normally receive. And how about this with David and Goliath? The giant is too big to miss. There is this huge, hulking, oppressive, rod-beating something out there that's staring you in the face that are the multitudes of locusts and they eat all your stuff, and they take all your possessions. And somehow, in God's one promise, it says, you are a mighty man of valor. That whole big giant goes down because he acts on the promise. Say that with me. The giant is too big to miss. And like I mentioned, they said, who, who tore down the Asherah pole? Don't be afraid of the attention that may come to you when you do God's will. Okay, water into wine. John 2, if you want to go with me, we're going to go to John 2. 50-50 chance, Old Testament or New. So, I said I was going to talk about the axe head deal, so I was listening to Stuart talk about the axe head, and there was nothing wrong with what he said, but it's like, God, what's the real deal? Like, I wanted to know for me, what's the real deal with this story? And he said, it's funny how the axe head is to build a new prophet's house, where they could have the sons of the prophets training, and Elisha had a place to live, and all of a sudden, the axe head flies off the axe handle, and all of a sudden, we're not talking about building the thing God asked us to build. We're going, it's borrowed. And all of a sudden, the issue is my reputation. And so I've lost sight of what God asked me to do over what happens, and now the whole issue is about me. And so that's one of the things I walked away with, because somewhere in life, that's going to come up. As you pursue God and as you try and do the things of God, I can't imagine that God's not going to walk you to the edge of your reputation and see which way you want to choose. Because if your reputation's at stake, God's will is never going to happen. You've got to let your reputation go. You've got to surrender for his will to happen. The other thing that struck me about the axe head is this. An axe head is worthless without a handle. So the other question is, what handle is your axe head attached to? So we'll talk about that in a second. Let's first talk about water into wine. John 2. On the third day, we're going to talk about two or three times we're going to hear third day. I think that's interesting. Not listen to the music group, but but it'll be in the scriptures. There's a wedding. Mary, Jesus is there, and they're all at the wedding, and somehow they run out of wine. And Mary comes to Jesus and says, dude, they don't have any wine. Jesus, in verse 4, says, woman, what is your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. She says, servants, do what he says to do. Now, let me talk about the middle of that. Jesus basically said, what have I got to do with this? Now, I'm going to make this up. It's not in Scripture, but I let my mind wander. We're supposed to meditate, and there's a word that King James uses called muse, M-U-S-E. Like when I uh, muse myself, I let my mind wander away to something that helps me lose my stress and makes me laugh and whatever I do. So we're going to do that. We're going to amuse or ponder away what could have happened. So if I was Mary, Mary might have said something like this. Jesus, what did you say to me? He said, Mom, what what have I got to do with this? Mary might have said, listen here, sonny boy. When I was 16, I hadn't even been to my high school prom yet. Your heavenly father came to me and said, I need you to bear the Savior of the world. And I had no idea how that would work. And I was scared to death. This might be silly, but she might have said, like, so Jesus, like, do I just get under the covers and it happens? Like, what do I do? I'm letting my mind wander. Silly as that might be. But she said, Jesus, I did it. I told him, yes. I didn't understand it, but I made a commitment. Jesus, you have been living a life so far. Yep, you run off to the temple and you talk to the elders, and it always frustrates me because you're always away, and I thought you were playing down the block with the kids on the street, and you were gone, and you never told me but I see you're the son of God, but what you've become so far is a great intellectual teacher. They call you rabbi now and teacher, and you have huge wisdom, 
but that's what it is. But your Heavenly Father wants you to go to the cross. And you need to know that the wind and the waves and all the things in this world are subject to you because actually when your Heavenly Father made all those, you stood right by Him. And He actually wrote about you and said, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And He created the worlds through you. And people need to know this is not just an intellectual exercise. This is not just an organized religion effort. This is about the miracle working power of your Heavenly Father. And you're going to need to know that because you're going to go to the cross and you're going to have the ability to say, peace be still, angels come and save me, and you're going to be silent. And you're going to let them put you on that cross. By the way, that's the axe handle that you're connected to is that cross. So Jesus, is your reputation at stake? Are you more worried about where you are in your ministry, or will you go do what your Father's called you to do? And your whole destiny lies on the other side of that decision. How's that for thinking out loud? So Jesus says, okay, if we're going to do this, then let's do this big. These pots, when you read about the pots, they're like half-liter barrels. Like somebody was going to be really happy (laughs) because there were six half-liter barrels of wine that somebody was still going to drink. And the implication is, when the servants got that all ready, they ladled out water and walked over to the guy that's the head of the wedding feast, and he drinks wine. So Jesus creates a great miracle, and it changes everything. From that day forward, all the miracles happen. You can imagine you're at the cross, Jesus is on the cross, and Channel 3 News is there with Mary. Mary... This is your son on the cross. He just said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. What was it like raising Jesus? And she might have said, you know, well, he used to run off and be down in the temple all the time. But somewhere they would say, and she might have said, I'm on TV. Is my hair fixed? You know, she's got makeup, you know, and she's cried and it's all a mess. That was a little joke. And she would have said, Mary, the announcer might have said, Mary, when did you know? that Jesus knew he would be the Savior of the world. And she might have said, you know, the day that he turned water into wine, something changed in him, and he fully understood surrender to his Father. And he knew he had to do the thing that he didn't think had anything to do with him. But in 20 seconds of embarrassing, what was the phrase? Bravery, whatever it was, he changes. So I would submit to you that God will take you to the edge of your reputation and he's going to ask you what is the axe handle and your ultimate axe handle is his promise for you. What was Gideon holding on to all the way back to the very first Gideon? You are a mighty warrior. That's how he swung his axe head and won the day was God's promise to him. And your whole destiny may rest on the other side of will you turn water into wine? Now, this time for us, it's not literally, but Jesus, the carpenter's son, who started studying the scriptures and became a wise teacher and was full of wisdom and intellectual, turns into the miracle-working King of kings and Lord of lords. So what about me? This common, everyday, ordinary guy has to look at the rest of his life and say, my destiny might be on the other side of saying, God, I'm ready to turn water into wine. I don't understand that yet. Like Mary, you got to show me how to do this, but I'm going to make a decision to go to the other side of that answer, and I'm going to answer it from the wine side. I'm going to get out of the wine vat. Jesus said, Gideon, go, or God said, Gideon, go. I'm just going to go. I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but 20 seconds of bravery and 20 seconds of courage here, I'm going to the wine side, and I'm going to start working this out. It's really quiet in here. Let me see what I missed. I wrote this down. You know, in the world, when you go to get a job, the first thing they ask you for is, what's your CV? I wrote this down. Go get your CV and shred it. God's not interested. Just surrender. Okay, Hebrews 11.11. I would go there, but we're going to keep moving on here. 
it's warm and the room is, the air is heavy in here. Hebrews 11:11. 11, 11, it says, Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, Sarah received strength to conceive because why? She went and lost some weight. She put a lot of makeup on. She thought she could make herself look better. Abraham would get excited again. Maybe it would happen. Or she judged God faithful that he would do his promise. So can I say that to you? I want you to say that. I will judge God faithful to do his promise. I receive strength to do that promise because he's faithful. Hebrews 10.23 says, Hold fast without wavering, for God is able to perform it. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, He will never leave you nor forsake you. Acts 4.13, it says, The apostles were with Jesus, and something happened to them. They were untrained, uneducated men, but all of a sudden the people marveled at how bold they were because they had been with Jesus, because they decided he was the Messiah, the Lord and Savior, and they would pick up his mantle. Acts 7.22, it says, Moses is excellent in speech, or he was mighty in words and in deeds. He was learned in all the ways of Egypt. Well, that doesn't make any sense, because what do we know about Moses? He stuttered. He asked God, for Aaron to help him because he couldn't get his sentences out. So his first 40 years in Egypt, he's this wonderful guy, silver-tongued devil, great leader. He sees a, 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 he, he kills an Egyptian. He runs off. He's got 40 years in the backside of the desert, cleaning up sheep poop the whole time. It smashes him. He's shattered, sees a burning bush, God comes to him like God came to Gideon and says, Moses, you're the man. I've got work for you to do. God comes back even later because Moses says he stutters. And he came back and said, um, he said, I want you to go. I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what to say. He hadn't actually let Aaron say him yet. Uh, uh, that's not say, speak for him yet. So Moses has got to blow his trumpet. He's got to call things to order. His 20 seconds of bravery, because it's God's promise, and he walks into Pharaoh and he says, Pharaoh, God, Yahweh, God, he, 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 he says, let my People go. In all the bravery and all the courage, he walks from water to wine. He gets out of the wine press vat. He decides, my God is bigger than my stuttering and all the stuff going on now. I mean, the story goes on that Aaron starts helping that out. But I guarantee you, Moses was the one that walked in and looked Pharaoh right in the eye, not Aaron, and said, you let my people go because God says so. Do not judge the moment, judge the promise, and judge the one who gave you the promise. Judge yourself worthy because he made you worthy, because he qualified you. The promise is backed by a person whose name is God. In the moment, the man on the cross doesn't look so good, but he's the savior of the world. Say this with me, just wait three days. You can wait three days and it all works out because God made you worthy. Once and for all, he broke a bondage and a rod of oppression. He cracked a shell around your peanut and said, I've got so many uses for you. I've got this laboratory called life, and I've got to give you a first promise to get up on there and go do this thing. Last part, John 21, 1 through 22, we're going to eat breakfast with Jesus. Say this with me, don't judge the moment, 
Judge the promise and the one who gave you the promise. Okay. This is Breakfast with Jesus, John 21. So the first thing you've got to remember is this. Peter's got an awful ache inside. He's been with this guy named Jesus. He's tried to be a good Jewish boy. He knows all the rules and regulations. He's been trying to keep them. He works hard at fishing. And this guy Jesus showed up. And Jesus is breaking all the rules. And he's tearing down all the things you ever thought about the law because it's real, live, flesh and blood, God in the flesh, love. And one day Jesus asked an innocent question. Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter's standing on the water side. And he goes, I've had enough. I'm going over. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. The scripture says, okay, stop. Kodak moment. Every man has to come to that conclusion. Every man must say that. Peter, well done. Later on, three times. You were with that guy, Jesus, Peter. Not me. That's your wife, Pam. I don't know that woman. How silly would that be? That's exactly what Peter did. Steve, that's your dad. Who? I don't know that guy. (laughs) Peter did that three times, and he's never been able to reconcile because Jesus died on the cross after that. Now, Jesus had appeared to them a couple of times, but he's got such an ache to say, can I just tell you I never meant it? He's looking for somehow some way that he can make this right in his heart. So what do we do when we've messed up with God? We just go back to what we know how to do. I go back and get in the wine vat again. I'm on the wine side and they go, nope, sorry, I got to go back to the water side again. In this case with these guys, I mean, it's a simple thing and maybe I'm making a little too much out of it, but they just go back to fishing. It's all we know to do. Jesus is, is raised from the dead, but we don't know where the guy is. I've got this ache inside of me. I don't know. I'm going fishing. So they fish all night long. Nothing happens. And then some guy on the beach goes, hey, I know you fished all night long and this is crazy, but just try the other side. And so they go, okay, this is nuts, but we're ready to quit. I I don't know. We'll do what the guy says. So they grab the nets. And I'm ad-libbing here a little bit. I like to story tell. But Peter, as he's throwing the nets, starts going, I've heard this before. I wrote down the scripture somewhere, I forget where it is, but but anyway, it it is in there. And so he's throwing the net going, I wonder, could somehow that guy be Jesus? Well, what happens is the net gets full of fish. I don't know why, but the Bible says 153. I'd like to think that's significant. 100's a great number, and 50's a great number, and 3's a great number, and you put them together, and it's a great number, and maybe it was just 153 fish. But it's so many fish, they can't hardly get the net out, although the net doesn't break. And somewhere in the middle of that, Peter has one of his little Peter revelations, like, oh, my God, I'll bet you that's Jesus. And he looks and like, it's the Lord. And so what does he do? I'm sorry, guys, you're going to have to pull the net in, but I'm going overboard. I tried this walking on water one other time, and it didn't work. So I'm going to try it again. If it doesn't, I'll swim. You know, and so he gets to the shore. And he's got to be soaking wet. You know, they wore all kinds of these robes and stuff like that. It reminded me, ever seen a movie where the, the, the dad comes home, hi, honey, I'm home, and there's three kids, and the kids have traced the kitchen, and there's baby vom on the mom, and, you know, she just starts crying. You know, it's a little bit like Peter showed up like that. God, I'm soaking wet, but it's you. So he says, it's the Lord, verse 7. And what's Jesus doing there? He's cooking. He's got a fire of coals, some fish, and some bread. And so the rest of the guys pull the fish in, and he says, come and eat breakfast. What goes off in their head again? Man, this feels a lot like the Lord's Supper. This feels a lot like multiplying fish and loaves and feeding the people. Isn't this cool? And so they start eating breakfast. And they've got scrambled eggs and sausages and some tomato wedges frying and some streaky bacon and toast with um, whatever you want to put on it. And so they probably lose their head. They've been fishing all night. They're hungry and they're just chewing up and chewing up. And in the middle of that, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter might went, what? 
Kind of like Gideon. Gideon, you're a mighty warrior. What? Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. I love you, Lord. I will. Bring you back to eating a second time. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Or it might be feed my sheep, feed my lambs. I'm not trying to get to. A third time. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. All of a sudden, the revelation opens up to Peter. I denied him three times. He just gave me three offerings of reconciliation. So let me say it to you this way. For every denial that you have, God has an offering. Jesus has an offering of reconciliation. There is nothing you can ever do that you run out of his reconciliation because he bought that on the cross and he smashed the yoke of bondage and he broke the shell over your peanut once and for all. And he loves you like chocolate over ice cream so that you'll want to get to the middle. You, want to, you need to be made new inside. That's the middle of God in my mind. The love is the way to get there. For every denial, there's an offering of reconciliation. The other thing he said is this. He talked about love, heart stuff. Let's call that B. But I've got stuff for you to do. Tend to my sheep. So I want you to be with me first and draw the strength to be able to go do. So let me say this phrase to you. The greater the need to do, the greater the need to be. The more God calls you to and the bigger the promise is and the more sphere of influence you have, the more time you've got to withdraw and spend time with God and find your character and find your heart with him so you'll be strong so when it's time to blow your trumpet, you blow your trumpet and that doesn't go you know we tried to do that with the shofar a couple of weeks ago and we blew it and it kind of like that and nothing happened the greater the need to do the greater the need to be the other thing that Peter is always kind of goofing up a little bit just to close this out but he kind of goes what about John How's this work for him? And Jesus basically says, John's going to be taken care of. Now, Jesus knew John would live till he was 90 on the Isle of Patmos and write Revelation and all that. He also knew that it wasn't going to be quite so keen for Peter. But he basically just says this, Peter, of all the stuff going on in the world and all the things you've done bad, and when your world is upside down, I've got two words for you. Follow me. Can you say that with me? Follow me. So that's what I want to close on. So let me see what I left out. And Steve, we can probably get ready to worship here just a little bit maybe. Three times denied, three times offered. For every denial, there's an offering of reconciliation. Affirm your relationship with me or be, and then go do out of our time that we be. The greater the need to do, the greater the need to be. Follow me. Let me say this too. Let me close with a couple other little phrases. When you're managing quality in a business, there's a thing called a bell-shaped curve. People seen that before? What the bell-shaped curve means, if you're manufacturing a product, that means when it's in the bell-shaped curve, we know how it's going to turn out. It's repeatable. It's on target. But they teach you that nothing happens better in your process if you don't do something different. So if that's your life, let me say this way. Nothing great ever happens staying in control. Nothing great is ever sustained staying out of control. If you stay on the water side instead of the wine side and you spend your life in the wine vat and your relationship with God is an intellectual relationship, you'll stay in control and nothing great will ever happen. But you've got to also realize you can't live life at breakneck speed. You have to get into a new layer of control. Life does have to be lived in balance. We are spirit, soul, and body, but it has moments of greatness with 20 seconds of bravery. Let him crack the nut and become the nut you were always made to be. God's promise wins your battle. Fish for a catch that should break the nets. Will you follow me? Will you surrender? What did the prophet say about Israel in the Midian story? Will you obey? So sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. Just literally 20 seconds 
of just embarrassing bravery, and I promise you something great will come of it. Amen. Steve's going to worship and just worship. You know, if you've got something that you heard tonight where you can go, my nut's not cracked. I'm on the water side instead of the wine side. I don't have the courage to do the promise I need to. I need 20 seconds of something. You know, the altar's available up here. If we just worship and we're done, then we're done.